that is what our next speaker has done. It gives me great, great pleasure to introduce uh, Thomas Madsen Mukdale, who, in my opinion, more than anyone else, really embodies the startup culture, IT startup culture here in here in Denmark, here in Copenhagen. Um, I could I could start listing things he's been involved with. I mentioned Podio earlier. He was involved with that. Uh, he's revolutionizing banking with Holby. He's working on system operations management with Offbeat. Um, so he has been doing this for uh, a number of years now and doing it very, very well. Uh, if you could do me a personal favor, uh, all of you, you don't know, you don't need to go into what it means, but just grab Thomas after this at some point and ask him, Thomas, when is the Reboot Conference coming back? Uh, please welcome Thomas Vazen Thanks, Alex. You're welcome. That was a... You know, just to start off on a really negative point in terms of one's bad, <laughs> bad moral. Okay, thanks everyone, and, and thanks for being given the opportunity today to share a little bit on on uh, on the Nordic way and and how we go uh, as Nordic people onwards. Uh, I'll start with a little icon, a little logo. How many of you go to to this website or this app, use this app every day? Okay. How many of you confess to actually doing it 10 times per day also? Okay, very sizable amount. So every time I look at this one, uh, the official story is that I'm hitting facebook.com. This amazing creation uh, by Mark Zuckerberg. Actually, even though there are actually a lot of people involved, but you know, that's the American story. Right? One guy made it all happen. Uh, they, already, they even already made a Hollywood movie around it, right? The network. It's the epicenter of the American story. It's a hundred billion dollar publicly listed company. It's a kind of massive American centralization of everyone in the world suddenly using the same platform uh, due to network effects. Um, and it is like the American dream, you know, when you really look at this logo and when you really look at what they've done. So everyone looks at it and like, ah, this is like, oh, this is what we should become. If only we could create the next Facebook, and if only we were like the Americans. For me, every time I look at that logo, I look at something very different. I look at every time I click on Facebook, there's a programming language called PHP, done by a Dane, that actually makes all the code run, all the code is running in that. Where they all store all their data is in a database called MySQL, done by a Finn and a Swedish guy, and it was a Swedish uh, action Olaf. The thing that actually keeps the whole ru thing running is an operating system called Linux, done by a crazy thing called Linux Torvalds. And uh, just to make the story even better, than the logo is actually done by two Danish guys, also. Uh, <laughs> although they were based in San Francisco, but so when you look at it, you know, behind all the bells and whistles, this is actually a Nordic story. <laughs> right? And we really don't think about that in our daily lives. How profound and how wild it is what we're doing as Nordic people. So let me do a little spiel for you here to, to just kind of get it all going. Linux, MySQL, Rails, Git, Varnish, PHP, C++, C Sharp, Opera, Skype, Spotify, ClickView, Braco, Sitecore, Type 3, EpiServer, 37, Signal, Centers, Podio, TradeShift, SoundCloud, Mojang, Rovio, Supercell, Unity. We'll just do that once again. <laughs> Basically, everything down deep in the stack, the operating system, the databases, the programming la languages, the, the, the frameworks, are done by Nordic people. If we look a little bit up to the application layer, Opera, you know, original web browser, Skype, Spotify, ClickView. When we look at all these CMS systems that run a lot of the websites, it's Umbraco, Danish guy, Sitecore, Danish, Type 3, App Server, Swedish. If we look at all the hottest stuff currently, the web apps, you know, 37 Signals, the kind of defining company for kind of creating cloud web apps was done by an you know, American guy and a Danish guy. Zendesk, the reason the IPO a couple of weeks ago, $1.3 billion valuation, was three Danish guys. They actually they eventually moved to SF, but you know. Podio, trade shop, invoicing, everyone, every time I talk about this in Berlin, then they say, but we have SoundCloud. And it's like, yeah, two Swedish guys. <laughs> Mojang, we're killing it in gaming. 
uh, Mojang, Romeo, Supercell, uh, Toka Poka, and all most of the games nowadays is developed by in a Danish uh, tool called Unity. Um, and this the story could go on, you know, uh, Bluetooth, Swedish. Uh, if you combine the three mobile carriers in the Nordics, they would be the third largest carrier globally, with about 320 million mobile subscribers in a population of 25 million people. So it just keeps going on and on and on, and you can get, kind of get this spiel going forever. So when you look at it, it's actually really profound that these 25 million people are doing things totally out of scale. The story and the stuff I just show you, showed you is unpre pre unprecedented for any other ecosystem. Silicon Valley might still be ahead, but there is no other even country in the world that is doing more or have contributed more to the digital world we live in today. So we have an amazing uh, story when we really start looking at it. The problem really is that we've been very confused in this kind of global, globalized world. And the Nordic story hasn't really been brought up. So every time we look at Denmark in itself, it's not really something on a global scale. When we look at Sweden in itself, yeah, it's okay happening, but it's not really something on a global scale. Yeah, Finland very hot now because of gaming, but still not really something on a global scale. And Nokia, let's not talk about that. Um, the same with Norway, apart from the oil and all this stuff. But when we really start combining the story together and looking at us as people that have something in common, have a very shared background, very shared culture, you know, we really have something profound. So when I'm out in the world, I tell the Nordic story. Because, I mean, the Copenhagen story might be very hot nowadays, but, you know, it's still the Nordic story that more tells the magic about what's going on. And obviously the magic is that we have 25 million people in very small countries. So we need to think global. And we've been thinking global more than anyone else. We're also in the top three in, uh, in non-native speaking of, of the English language. Uh, and we have, you know, this whole, all the stuff they have in Germany and the UK where they have huge home markets we don't have any of. So we really need to think globally from day one. And the Vikings and whatever else, good stories you want to come, come up with in terms of conquering the world. So what I'm seeing is a whole new generation of people being out there, conquering the world, building global companies, trying to disrupt the world. So why is, is, is really entrepreneurship then you know, a theme here? Because I think we're, it's a very important thing that the Nordic story is also about entrepreneurship uh, and not only about our societies. Uh, you know, our society is great, but if we, if we don't make it a story of entrepreneurship, you know, we're nothing in, the, in this context. People remember Skype and Spotify, and they think about them as Nordic com companies. They don't really look at all the deeper stuff, etc. Now and then we also need these, these hits. So when you, when you really look at entrepreneurship, um, there's many opin opinions on what it is about these days. If you talk to government uh, people, it's about job creation, because we're still in a crisis and our economies are flat and we can't really figure out what's going on. Um, if you talk to VCs, it's about financial return above market rate. If you talk to entrepreneurs, it's probably more about the journey and the ride and the crazy uh, adventure you can be on. But if we really look at it from a systemic standpoint, for me, entrepreneurship is really about the new. How do we empower the new to happen in our societies? How do we allow change to happen? And when we look at entrepreneurs, they are the new. They are the ones that are coming with nothing. Now and then they also leave with nothing again. But they come with nothing. They come with no bias, no preconceived ideas of how the world should be. And they attack. They attack the status quo. They try to get us to see the world in a different way. Not always su su successful, not always right. But they are the ones that are moving things ahead. They're changing our perspectives. Even when they don't succeed financially or uh, building companies or whatever, they still change the, ex the, es the establishment and the existing companies. You heard a guy from Microsoft earlier. Nowadays, Microsoft is a cloud, la 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 company. That's not what Microsoft is. They've been fundamentally changed from the outside because of a huge inflow of startups that are challenging the world we live in. So the startups are the, the crazy ones. They're the ones that want to do crazy stuff. 
They're the ones that reorganize things to have meaning again. We see old systems that doesn't make sense. And then we just like, ah, we, we can use this in a, in a more clever way. Not because startups and entrepreneurs are more clever. They just have a very different standpoint that they come from. They're actually now and then almost probably more stupid because you wouldn't do a lot of the st stuff you need to do as, a, as, a, as an entrepreneur if you're really rationally thinking because it is a hard time now and then it gives you a lot of gray hairs. Um, so one, just also on the kind of societal impact, back after the dot-com boom, uh, I was really depressed. Uh, all this internet stuff that we started in 94, 95 had all these great ambitions, how it would change society, create new meaning, create a participatory society. All this stuff just was like, you know, some public stock market game so our fathers could clap us on the shoulders and we were, you know, a part of the establishment again and the whole thing fell through. Back then I was reading a, an amazing book called The Utopian Entrepreneur by a woman called Brenda Laurel and she had this great kind of little statement, first we create the tools, then the tools create us. And this, that was really profound for me uh, as a designer and, and change maker in terms of why also specifically digital tools are so important. Because we, we are not just a little thing, we are a whole new dimension and we have a tremendous responsibility because the tools we create create new realities. They change the behavior more profoundly than anything else. Then culture, obviously combined with the technology. But I mean, it is the technology that, that fundamentally makes new things possible. And we embody them with our values, with our mindsets, with our perspectives that we put into these tools in terms of what world you want to live in. We would still be living in, a, in an ERP system <laughs> if it hadn't been for entrepreneurs that thought collaboration and working together could be a different thing. You would still make queries to a database uh, you know, most public sector systems are still kind of like that, but that's a different story that we'll come back to. So, our challenge is, as a society, we really need the new to be possible. We need equal tax laws, so the multinationals aren't paying tax in the Nordics, which they, which they aren't, but the little guy's paying, you know, his, his corporate tax, but the big guys don't pay them. We, as a society, have an interest and a big obligation to make sure that the new is possible at all times. And when you look at a lot of these companies, they really embody these kind of value shifts and par paradigm shifts in them. When I'm speaking with young entrepreneurs, I have a thing called the entrepreneurial stack just to show them kind of, you know, what is it that you have? Is it a hack? Is it a feature? Is it really a product? Is it actually something that could become a company? Do you actually have a vision of what you want to do? Are you betting on, on, on value shifts happening and paradigm shifts happening in the world? So something like Podio is an online work collaboration platform that we built from the basement in, in three years to impacting how millions of people and hundreds of thousands of organizations are working globally. You know, we, we really had these two very deep values around, um, around transparency and around empowerment the organizations. Very Nordic values, you might say, that we wanted to empower everyone to work the way they wanted to and not how the IT department like we all do with Excel and Word and, and PowerPoint and Keynote and whatever, that we were empowered to build our own tools because the, the people doing the work would know better what the tools actually were. And transparency and openness in organizations so everyone can see what's going on, so they can see the dynamics at the workplace and work together better. So this is a good example of why entrepreneurship really matters and why we also as Nordic people have a very defined, designed, conscious perspective and that we sometimes not need to hide a little bit and, and also adopt a little of the brutal American, uh, you know, ban more banal approach now and then. But that's why we really can, can change things and make interesting things happen. But one big challenge if we look at the Nordic story is that the Nordic story is really also about societies with very distinct societal model, uh, public sector involvement, uh, coming from a pretty industrial mindset in, in many ways. And obviously the, the big challenge nowadays is that we are kind of in a different world. And you know, Paul Bar Barron's great uh, uh, illustration here showing a, a network typography from, from his 1963 proposal for the internet or for the ARPANET, uh, the first version, kind of iconically kind of gives you the challenge that when suddenly no one is really in control and we have this very decentralized uh, society that we're currently living in due to, the, to many uh, ways technology and great education which we have in the Nordics which basically empowers small groups of people from anywhere in the Nordics to do amazing things together. 
what is the act of working together with the public sector? How are we working not against each other, but together? And that's a really profound challenge that we very specifically have in the Nordics. If we look at it, um, you know, we always grow together. A couple of the names that I showed you, you, you earlier actually came, you know, most of the people there grew together. A lot of us actually were sitting in the same co-working space 12 years ago, including our, your generous host, Alexander, today, uh, inspired by the idea of just very young people that suddenly saw everyone starting to step the game up. When we started out back in the 90s, we were copying the Americans. We were doing local versions of Yahoo and Google in our small local countries. What is now happening is we're building big global disruptive companies. For me personally, that took about 15, 20 years until we had the confidence to do it. A lot of it came from doing the Reboot Festival, where suddenly we had all these guys that had done Twitter and all these tools and all this stuff, and we were hanging out with them for a couple of days, they weren't much better than us. They were also just some, you know, Ev who's done Twitter and, and Medium and Blogger, and Nebraska farm boy that moved to SF to, to show what he could do for the world. He was just like us. So it really takes a lot of kind of ecosystem in, involvement and a lot of ecosystem peers to really see us move up. And that is, you know, very different from our very industrial facility model of, okay, you start as an entrepreneur here, and then there's this university incubator, and then you move there, and then you move there, and then you move there. It's kind of very industrial, very well-intended model that we have. But it's, not, it's just another world out there, and the entrepreneurs really learn from each other and from the ecosystems they're a part of. Nowadays, a young guy coming into Copenhagen will be together with people building global companies, and he'll be like, yeah, sure, I can do that. that like, you know, I'm actually brighter than those guys or girls already doing it, right? So we step the game up together. And that's a real challenge, also in terms of how we connect the Nordics. So when we look at it, there's a lot of stuff we need to reinvent. And we actually perhaps have an even greater challenge as, as Nordic people in terms of also looking at a lot of the under societal uh, levels. We have data on all our citizens, unlike anything else, because nobody actually dared to do that. In, in all the other countries, but we're also faced with all the problems and, uh, and the dilemmas of it. This morning, um, the Spiegel, uh, Danish newspaper Information, and Laura, Laura Petres, the Pulitzer Prize winning uh, journalist for the Snowden Disclosures, disclosed un in unprince unprecedented ways that Denmark, 14 kilometers from here, um, just next to the airport, has an NSA facility that have all the fiber cables going from the Nordics to Central Europe, and all the fiber cables going from the Nordics to the UK, and they're wired having uh, all the fiber cables. Uh, we live in weird times, where we as a society really need to kind of reinvent ourselves in a digital context, you know, and we are on many levels uh, still <laughs> lagging uh, the public discourse and the public conversation uh, around a lot of the issues. Uh, today's uh, um, Today's response from the Danish government has been not to deny, but to claim that nothing illegal is going on. So, you know, not even reacting to it. I think it would be different in Sweden or, or Finland if, if the news like that broke. So we have really profound, tough questions that if we start answering them and build the models and the systems, you know, then we can both, you know, do something for the world and we'll eventually also build all the companies that have the tools to live in a world with a lot of data and a lot of private data flowing between all kinds of institutions and how we really do it in the Nordic way. You know, not just a brutal decentralized, you know, I don't trust anyone model, but in a balanced model that we as Nordic people really can do. We also have, as I said earlier, the real challenge of kind of reinventing our, our startup ecosystems to work with all the public sector involvement, but not really killing it and realizing that the public sector startup ecosystems is a little part of the greater large, larger ecosystem. We have a real challenge to really connect the Nordics, you know. Being in Copenhagen, you know, um, it, there's, you know, Berlin and London being the current kind of two, or two other major cities in Europe, Berlin is closer than any Nordic cap capital for me to fly to, you know. It's a 40 minute flight and, you know, Copenhagen being a very nice city, you can get to the airport in about 15 minutes, you can get through the airport in 15 minutes and then you have a one hour and 15, whatever minute daily commute. 
So what is, it, what is it really that connects us together? How are we not looking outwards, but really discovering ourselves inwards? A lot of good things are happening. There's a lot of social relationships starting to, to happen between the Nordic cities. There's a lot of hiring starting to happen between the Nordic cities. But you know, we're still not there. And this is not something uh, the Nordic Council can fix uh, totally. It's not something our governments totally can, can fix. This is a lot about personal relationships, building trust and community, and stepping up the game as the Nordics together and telling the story. It's also a challenge to look at all the digital platforms. We, we will be, li be living in a society that's highly digital and also has a pretty big public sector across the Nordics. That's not going to change anytime soon. And I guess most of us don't really want it to have it profoundly changed, but perhaps just made it slightly better and, and reinvented. So there is so much opportunity. In the Nordics alone, there's around 15 billion euro. I, re I repeat again, 15 billion euro in public IT spending. And as we also spoke about a bit earlier, um, I, I, can say, I, can, I can fairly assume today that very little of that is going to innovative companies and startups that actually have great talent and can build amazing solutions. Most of the money goes to big five consulting companies that outsource a lot of the work to India. That in itself is probably not good for our economies, but I think the greater problem is really that we don't have the best people of our generations working on all these digital platforms. I'm at a level personally where I'm starting to opt out of all the Danish digital platforms that they require us to use because they're so badly done that, you know, I'm, I'm in my kind of our friends, we've started discussing that we for six months want to do an opt out where we won't accept any digital communication from the public sector. will only require letters to be sent to our mailboxes. But that's the state we're in because we don't have the best people. And it's not about money, it's not about anything. It's really about talent. The, you know, the usability and whatever, I mean, stuff that we were taught in school 20 years ago. Um, so we, what would really happen if we connected these 15 billion euro together with, I mean, you know, public health sector, instead of giving the contract to one big company, what happens if we make industries and competition happen and get five small companies that also gets investment in them because they got a contract and then we end up building whole new industries. It's very, you know, I'm a civil guy, so I mean, that, for me that's like, mm, why we're we not doing that? that? That would be kind of stupid. I mean, instead of giving it to companies not even paying taxes and all this. So there's a lot of stuff and we really need to get this kind of public, private, thing really starting to happen because else you'll just see a lot of global companies being built out of the Nordics but like a lot of the earlier generation and including a lot of the logos and names I showed you they'll end up having headquarters in SF at some point they'll even reincorporate and perhaps be US companies because that's better for them etc etc so in this new globalized world we still need to make sure that we actually have a lot of these companies and it's the Nordic thing is not just a story so, we live in a time that's really interesting. 20, 20 odd years ago, uh, just after we started the first internet company in, in the beginning of 95 in Denmark, uh, I had to get my mom and dad to accept me taking a, a leave from high school. And I was trying to explain to them that this was like an unprecedented time where things were happening and the internet and you know, I could always go back to high school. Uh, I haven't gotten back there yet. Uh, because there is just so much stuff that we need to do. My call of action and urge to you guys is to really put one foot in front of the other and start attacking like entrepreneurs or let the entrepreneurs attack, not to destroy, but to reinvent all the amazing things we have and take the Nordic model even further. Take the Nordic story and the Nordic way from being more than a good branding story which we obviously also should do and get our princesses and crown princesses and great beautiful designed embassies all across the world and hook them into the startup ecosystem. That's like, you know, that's the easy way and we can do that tomorrow. But to really connect the Nordics together so that we can build these companies and, and use these, the great amount of knowledge we have in the, in the, in the different countries. So let's, let's challenge the status quo. Let's try to come together and let's try to be something for the world take the Nordic story and the Nordic way to the next level. Thank you. Before you go, before you go.
Right. Before you go, Thomas. Yeah. Um, quick question. Get up here. What gives you hope? What makes you think the think makes you think that this will happen? That this will work? What gives my What gives you hope that this will actually take? That they will find this new Nordic uh, model. You always have good questions like that, <laughs> and always kind of positive framing of things, which is that. Um, it gives me hope that uh, I, the last 12 months uh, I spent. Uh, it gives me hope that this is really happening, whether we want it or not. Kind of the the, the, the kind of the simple startup story, the, the kind of very Americanized startup story. That's really happening. I mean, uh, Upbeat, which was two young guys that Stefan that you'll see on stage uh, uh, later said that I should do coffee with, and then Stefan and I invested in them, wrote the first check. Uh, they actually never were working without our salary. They had a check from day one. And six months later, the, the co-founders of Instagram, Facebook, and Spotify had invested in them, and crazy things happening. So that really gives me hope. But, that's, but, my, but it also gives me the concern that we're not really, that's just an American model, right? That's just something that could happen anywhere when you start having the ecosystems really working. It's not really connected to our societies, and that's where, you know, there perhaps is less hope. Although it really gives me hope, all the great people I meet in the public sector. Uh, I've spent a lot of time the last 12 months on a lot of kind of policy work, and every time you really con connect with individuals, I'm profoundly impressed by their qualities and their thinking and their willingness to do things. But then, obviously, the next day I get very depressed by what we actually <laughs> are able to get done and all the great, all the old structures and systems working towards change. Yeah. And also the <laughs> profound impact from a lot of big companies in the Nordics that, uh, well, I mean, it's their role to battle change, it's their role to fight for their role and their financial, uh, you know, income, and they're much, they're much better at, at the public diplomacy and spin doctors and all the behind the scenes stuff. Simple guys like us, first of all, we don't really we're not that clever and we're not good at manipul manipulating people and we really also don't want to spend the time on it. So that sure. gives me, that, that's the stuff that gives me more concern than we really do. I like how you take that answer too positive. <laughs> <laughs> Give Thomas Mesenbukdale a big round of applause.